The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, ECCB, celebrates 40 years of transformative leadership and innovation. The ECCB has been diligently fulfilling its mission of advancing the good of the people of the currency union for 40 years by maintaining monetary and financial stability and promoting growth and development. It is the monetary authority for a population of more than 600,000 people spanning six sovereign states, Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Christopher, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and two overseas territories of the United Kingdom, Anguilla and Montserrat. On October 1st, 1983, the East Caribbean Currency Authority, ECCA, was upgraded to a central bank, the ECCB. The ECCB's predecessor, the ECCA, had been established in 1965 to issue and manage EC currency after its predecessor, the British Caribbean Currency Board, dissolved in 1964 when Diana and Trinidad and Tobago withdrew membership to form their own central banks. Shortly after Barbados signaled its intention to withdraw from the ECCA and establish its own central bank, the West Indies Associated States Council of Ministers decided to move the headquarters of the East Caribbean Currency Authority to St. Kitts. One year after Barbados's withdrawal, ECCA's headquarters transferred to St. Kitts on May 20th, 1975, situated at the corner of Central and Church Streets. The move to St. Kitts was overseen by the manager director of the ECCA, Sir Cecil Jacobs, a national of St. Kitts and Nevis. The next year, on July 7, 1976, the EC dollar was pegged to the US dollar at a fixed rate of EC $2.70 to US $1. Nearly seven years later to the day, on July 5, 1983, seven governments signed the agreement establishing the ECCB as the monetary authority with Anguilla eventually signing on as a full member on April 1, 1987. On October 1, 1983, the ECCB was officially commissioned and operated out of the former ECCA headquarters. Three months later, the first meeting of the Monetary Council established in accordance with Article 7 of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Agreement was held on January 20, 1984. Sir Cecil Jacobs, who was then the first governor of the ECCB, led an initial staff of 55 persons. He was ably assisted by Sir Errol Allen, a Vincentian who served as deputy governor until his retirement on March 31, 2005. The first ECCB agency office was established in Grenada on November 1, 1984, paving the way for the expansion of the ECCB's footprint to all its member countries. On October 1, 1987, the ECCB Agency Office in St. Lucia was established, followed by one in Dominica on November 1, 1989, and one in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on April 1, 1990, with the remaining ECCB Agency offices opening up the next year. Montserrat on March 4, 1991, then Anguilla on May 23rd, and Antigua and Barbuda on June 15, 1991. 
On November 21, 1992, a ceremony was held to break ground for the construction of the new ECCB headquarters at Bird Rock. The bank moved into its new headquarters in August 1994 and it was officially opened on October 29th that year. Sir Cecil Jacobs retired in September 1989 and Sir K. Dwight Venner of Vincentian became governor of the ECCB from December 1st, 1989 and served until his retirement in November 2015. The present governor, Mr. Timothy N.J. Antoine, a Grenadian, assumed the role on February 1st, 2016. The year 2022 was a year of recognition for the ECCB. The ECCB introduced Polymer Notes in 2019 and won the Best New Banknote Series from Reconnaissance. Come October 1st, the date that the ECCB was put into force 40 years ago, the ECCB headquarters will be entirely carbon neutral. This is thanks to a solar canopy project started in 2017, which was recognized with the Central Banking 2022 Green Initiative Award. Ever in the vanguard of innovation, the ECCB on March 31, 2021 introduced Dcash, the first central bank digital currency, CBDC, to be launched by a currency union. As the ECCB enters its 40th year, the governor is adeptly supported by the institution's first female deputy governor, Dr. Valda F. Henry, a national of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Ms. D. Tracy Polius, a national of St. Lucia, who serves as Chief Director Policy. Dr. Henry succeeded Mr. Trevor Brathwaite of St. Lucia, who served as the second Deputy Governor from 2006 to 2021. There is no way to fit all that the ECCB is, does, and means for the people of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, into this historical reel. You are therefore invited to log on to the ECCB's virtual museum when it launches later this year to get a full-fledged history of this pioneering central bank. The leadership and the staff of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank proudly celebrate the bank's 40th Ruby anniversary and dedicate this year of festivities to you, the people of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank's 40th anniversary lecture series, the Dominica edition. And I'm going to dare to say that this is going to be the best edition um, because, of course, you know, as Dominicans, when we do things, we do things very well. And we expect to have a very engaging and riveting discussion. Um, we also hope to welcome some questions from you as the audience, as well as some online questions as well. Uh, but before we begin, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Annika Bellot. I am an attorney at law by profession, specializing in environmental law. I have a passion for climate justice and environmental issues myself. I also I work at the National Bank of Dominica Limited as the legal officer there. And I also own two small businesses, one where I sell plants, it's called the Water in Can, and I also do Instagram Reels, and I'm known as Nature Island Nikki. And I promote Dominica as a go-to destination for everything entertainment, adventure, and everything in between. So I'm a multifaceted person myself. Um, I hope that we can also have a, you know, we have a, a very multifaceted panel also, and we're going to have a very engaging discussion this evening. So the 40th anniversary celebrations have been designed to be reflective but propulsive as we advance policy design and implementation to support transformation of the respective economies within the ECCU. So our event this evening in Dominica, we hope to achieve critical reflection on ways in which Dominica's uniqueness can be used for economic development. The theme this evening is leveraging Dominica as the nature isle, and we're going to be exploring the orange and green economies. And it will be explored from five different angles. We have, first, we will have a presentation from Mr. Colin Piper, where he will explore marketing the nature isle. We will then have a presentation from Mr. Sam Raphael, 
linkages in the nature aisle. He will be followed by Ms. Liz Rafabian, who will be discussing opportunities in the nature aisle. And Liz will be followed by Mr. Ken George Dill, who will be discussing sites, treasures, and pleasures. And our final presenter this evening will be Mr. McCarthy Marie, who will be exploring the creatives. So we hope that the panelists and the participants can offer realistic recommendations that can be implemented in a timely manner, bearing in mind cost implications. And so that is what our discussion will be surrounding this evening. And to also, just as a, a means of announcement, we ask that you, if you haven't already, that you place your phones on silent, just to ensure that we don't disrupt the conversation that's going on. Um, and we would also request that you stand at this moment, as we will have the national anthem by Mr. Ajani Schlinford. And then we ask that you remain standing, where we will invite Pastor Randy Rodney to lead us in the invocation. So we invite Mr. Johnny Schillingford. Isle of beauty, Isle of splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gift so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills, and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy land, so like all fountains, giving cheer that warms the soul. Dominica. God has blessed thee with a climb benign and bright. Pastures green and flowers of beauty filling all with pure delight. And a people strong and healthy, full of godly reverend fair. May we ever seek to praise thee for this gift. So rich and rare. Come ye forward, sons and daughters of this gem beyond compare. Strive for honor. Sons and daughters, do the right, be firm, be fair. Toil with hearts and hands and voices, we must prosper, sound the call in which everyone rejoices. All for each and each for all. Thank you. And we ask that you remain standing as we invite Pastor. We pray tonight recognizing that in the book of Genesis chapter 1, God gave man special instructions to manage the earth. And in managing the earth, my brothers and sisters, you and I from this lovely nature isle 
need to manage paradise. Uh, I often say to people that uh, Dominica is where God lives. Uh, everywhere else he visits. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful for this evening. A moment when we pause to look at our nation reflectively, but look at our nation from the perspective of implementing some of the wisdoms that you have granted us. We ask, Lord, that as our presenters present, that we too we will receive, will receive, Father God, with the intention of ensuring that we save this paradise, that we enhance this environment, that we manage this place, Father God, to your honor and glory. Tonight we ask that as we listen, as we interact, that which we will take away from here will help us as we create, as it were, a better environment, a better natural environment for all of us first. And for those who will visit with us, those who will accompany us in this lovely Waiti Kubuli. Bless this proceedings tonight. And Father God, we ask that all the honor and glory redound to your throne room. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask this. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor Rodney. And we, as we move into our program this evening, we are going to move to the video presentation by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank's Deputy Governor, Dr. Valda F. Henry. If you know Dr. Henry, she's a daughter of the soil, so when I say good things come from Dominica and we're going to have the best edition, I mean that. So we are now going to move to the video presentation uh, from Dr. Valda F. Henry. Good evening. When the lecture subcommittee at the start of the ECCB Art 40 year of reflection, celebration, and implementation came up with its plan. It came up with seven lecture series in our seven countries, member countries outside of headquarters, and one global conference. This evening, the Dominican edition of the lecture series is the last of the lecture series. The ECCB Art 40 Global Conference will take place at headquarters from November 8th to the 10th. This evening, our theme, Leveraging Dominica as a Nature Isle. We all know the tagline for Dominica. Dominica, the Nature Isle. The food basket of the region. And so, the question becomes, how do we leverage Dominica? How do we leverage Dominica to growth, to peace, and to prosperity as the nature island? In July 2023, Dominica was voted by the readers of travel and leisure as the number one island Caribbean destination, second time in a row. The criteria for this award was based on several factors including nature, adventure, amenities, hospitality of the hotel and the tourism sector, and the people. We scored B. The quest is, now that we have won this accolade as many others, because in fact, some of our facilities have been voted, example, Secret Bay, as the number one resort in the Caribbean. How do we leverage these accolades to greater success and development of Dominica? This evening, we have put together a panel encompassing various areas and various persons. We have Mac Marie, who, as I say, when it comes to the creative industry, he knows it on all sides from the side of a promoter, from the side of a manager, from the side of the artist, and from the side of Echo. There is Sam Raphael, 
an entrepreneur par excellence. One who, after Hurricane Maria, destroyed Jungle Bay in Delices. Another person of lesser metal might have folded up. But what did he do? He reinvented, and in fact, that's what you call a true reset. And we have Jungle Bay based in Sufria. Carry on the tradition of the original Jungle Bay, and maybe even expanding it. It's truly a place for adventure, for peace, for embracing in all that Dominica has to offer. There is Ken George Deal, one of our most seasoned, if not the most seasoned, tour operator in Dominica, who can give us insights on the adventure Dominica has to offer. There is Lisa Fabian, who for many years served as the executive director of the Dominica Chamber of Commerce and Industry, interacting with the business community and the private sector and can give us insights from that end. Then there is Colin Piper, who is the executive director of Discover Dominica. Again, like Mark, Colin sees the industry from all angles, from the side of the promoting the creative industry, because World Creole Music Festival, Carnival, to name a few, fall under his portfolio. But it's not just about the creative industry. He has to promote the destination, Dominica, that falls under his portfolio. So it's leveraging the green and the orange econ economies, creative and what we have to offer. And our moderator, Ms. Annika Bellot, brings into, into play her, her legal background as well as her entrepreneurship background because she is a young entrepreneur. And so tonight, this lecture is really going to look at so many facets of our economy to provide advice, to provide a blueprint on how we can leverage Dominica as the nature island of not just the Caribbean, but the nature isle of the world, bringing for us not just economic development, but also social development. Because we recognize, as we have seen, that economic development without social development leads to a lot of ills. And so social and economic development must go hand in hand. I invite you to sit back and to be engaged. We want you to prefer your comments, your questions, and make your contribution in how we can leverage Dominica as the nature island of the Caribbean for socio and economic development. We have touched on so many topics over the last seven months. Be engaged, be involved. We thank you for joining and we look forward to an active, robust and rich discussion this evening. Thank you and God bless. I think after that presentation from Dr. Henry, we, we don't even need to introduce the panelists anymore. We've thoroughly discussed the topic. <laughs> but we thank Dr. Henry for her contribution this evening. Um, and at this point, we know that our topic, our theme this evening is leveraging Dominica as the nature isle. And this is a very important topic for us this evening. And we're going to have a video promotion, which is going to introduce the topic to the audience. The Commonwealth of Dominica, commonly known as the Nature Isle of the Caribbean, is a volcanic island in the Lesser Antilles known for its natural beauty. Named Waitukubuli by the native Kalinago people, the island possesses treasures uncommon not just in the region but throughout the world. It is home to lush green forests which support a diverse range of plants and animals, towering mountains, thunderous waterfalls, and the second largest boiling spring in the world. 
Dominica has become a popular destination for ecotourists and adventure travelers seeking a unique experience. In 2022, Travel and Leisure magazine ranked Dominica as the best island in the Caribbean, praising its natural and unspoiled beauty. According to Precedence Research, the global ecotourism market size was estimated at US dollar 216.23 billion in 2022, with its reach expected to grow to US dollar 923.88 billion by 2032. The government and people of Dominica are working to capitalize on this lucrative and booming market with the government continuing to invest heavily in its tourism products. Post-pandemic, it has moved swiftly to re-energize the industry with innovative products consolidating its commitment to sustainable tourism. The agricultural industry also continues to play a critical role in Dominica's economy, contributing an estimated 17% to the country's GDP. It is estimated that 25-30% to 30 of the workforce is employed within the agriculture sector, which has seen growth of around 12% in the last four years. The Nature Isle has had its share of economic adversity, having been hit with a succession of shocks in the last eight years, which include the passage of Tropical Storm Erica in 2015, Hurricane Maria in 2017, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, the economic outlook for Dominica is positive. It is anticipated that in 2023, growth will be driven by expansions in the tourism sector with a spill over into other sectors. It is against this backdrop to bring you the ECCB Act 40 Anniversary Lecture Series, the Dominica Edition. Leveraging Dominica as the major island, the orange and green economies. Okay, so now that we have a brief of our theme this evening, I think we can safely move into what we're all here for, the panel discussion from our dynamic panelists. And I'm going to just introduce them to you. I know probably that's a bit redundant, <laughs> but of course they are such dynamic individuals that there's always more to say about them. And we are going to move into our panel discussion segment. And our first presenter will be Mr. Colin Piper. Mr. Piper has been at the helm of the Discover Dominica Authority since 2009, leading the authority and driving the destination's tourism growth while steering the destination out of many natural disasters and other shocks. Mr. Piper has championed numerous destination marketing campaigns, been active in, produ in the production of Dominica's Marquee Festivals, where he was a part of the inception team for the World Creole Music Festival, and has been a member of the Air Access Committee since its inception in 2013. He has over three decades of sales, marketing, and operations experience, both domestically and internationally. Before I read the, the, the next bio, I'd like you to just give a round of applause for Mr. Colin Piper. Our second panelist this evening is Mr. Sam, Samuel Sam Raphael. Mr. Raphael is recognized as one of the Eastern Caribbean's most innovative entrepreneurs with lucrative groundbreaking models in aviation, sustainable tourism, and real estate development. As the owner of, of award-winning businesses in different Caribbean jurisdictions, he provides invaluable insights to clients. He is always eager to share his wealth of knowledge of the Caribbean and his practical business experience. Sam's successful business track record highlights his long-standing commitment to the empowerment of Caribbean people through sustainable tourism. His passion for delivering high-quality, scalable ventures is well-recognized by Virgin Holidays Award, TripAdvisor, Forbes, among others. Mr. Raphael is the developer and managing director of Jungle Bay, Dominica. A round of applause for Mr. Raphael. Our third panelist this evening is Ms. Lizer Fabian. 
With over a decade of experience in private sector development, Lizra Fabian has been a strong advocate for the development of the private sector and micro, small, and medium enterprises with special attention to disaster risk reduction. Lizra is currently the Caribbean Project Manager for the Organization of American States Project, Economically Empowered Women for Equitable and Resilient Societies, being implemented across six Eastern Caribbean countries. Lizra recently served as the Executive Director of the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce, the leading private sector representative body in Dominica. Her service to the Chamber continues as the Arise Dominica Focal Point and board member of the UN Global Arise Network. Lizra volunteers as the Director of Entrepreneurship of the GEMS Foundation and as an avid traveler, Lizra represents and promotes Dominica globally through her work and personal travels. Lizra Fabian. Our fourth panelist this evening is Mr. Kenneth George Dill. Mr. Dill is the owner and manager of CATS, an acronym for Ken's Hinterland Adventure Tours and Transfer Service. I always wondered what that meant. He specializes in hiking, botany tours, rainforest expeditions, cultural tours, sightseeing tours, bird watching, airport transfers, hotel accommodations, tour operator representation, ground handling service. He is the complete package and includes activities for activities and accommodation. He also specializes in educational programs for university students. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Dill. And our final panelist is by no means our least, Mr. McCarthy Murray. Mr. McCarthy Marie is an economist, music business entrepreneur, and intellectual property expert. Mr. McCarthy Marie is an economist whose journey encompasses a profound love for economics, music, culture, and an enduring partnership with his wife, Ophelia. Together, they have shaped this remarkable path, leading him to expertise in intellectual property. He was born and raised in Dominica, and McCarthy's passion for economics and music has been the driving force in his life. With academic excellence in economics, he has passionately explored the economic impact of music and cultural preservation. His pioneering research has illuminated the transformative potential of cultural investments in stimulating economic growth, job creation, and community well-being. Let's have a round of applause for our final panelists. And to get straight into the discussion, we welcome our first panelist, Mr. Colin Piper. Okay, good evening to all. Pleasure to be here as part of the panel for the ECCB 40th Anniversary Lecture Series, Dominica edition under the theme, Leveraging Dominica as the Nature Isle. So much to say, so little time. Um, so let's get right into it. I focused more on the green economy than the orange, but I will be happy to make a contribution to the orange in the Q&A. So let's talk a little bit about what I will um, focus on and the importance of tourism, the emerging trends in tourism, the alignment of Dominica's offerings with the trends, marketing the nature island and marketing strategies to leverage Dominica as the nature island. So in terms of the importance of tourism, approximately 1.5 billion tourists travel globally pre-pandemic, and 66% or 960 million traveled in 2022 post-pandemic. Of that figure, about 32 million traveled to the Caribbean pre-pandemic and about 28.3 million post-pandemic, or 88.6%. And coming down closer to home, about 89,626, well, 89,626 to be exact, came to Dominica 
right? And in, that was pre-pandemic 2019. That was the highest on record. And in 2022, 67.8% or 61,037 came. Furthermore, we see that tour, travel and tourism accounts for about 10.4% of global GDP or 10% of global employment. In Dominica, those figures are about 19.3% of GDP and 25% of jobs. That's according to the World Travel and Tourism Council. So we can see that the Caribbean is a very desirable destination for leisure tourists, having outperformed the global stats for 2022 in terms of the rebound. And uh, there are different pros and cons or inhibitors to regenerating the tourism trade in each of the islands of the Caribbean. Among them uh, would be on-island experiences and products, as well as access. Let's take a look at some of the trends. You can see the list here, and I'll make mention of a couple uh, based on research um, over the internet. We can see some of the uh, trends that have been collated. Uh, sustainable tourism is expected to grow at an annual rate of 10%, making up 20% of the tourism market by 2030. That's according to UNWTO. And according to Global Wellness Institute, the wellness tourism market was valued at about 640 million in 2019 and is projected to reach 1.1 trillion by 2025. Adventure tourism is one of the fastest growing segments with a growth rate of 17.4% according to Allied Market Research. And Booking.com says 67% of travelers seek authentic experiences that enable them to learn about local culture. So while we talk about sustainable and responsible travel, and that is a key trend, travelers are also asking that we provide clarity in terms of what that means to us so that they can determine whether that is aligned with what they perceive to be um, responsible and sustainable travel. And in that way, they can make a decision as to whether to come to your destination or whether to stay at your property. And there's also this double-edged sword that um, persists with sustainable tourism in that businesses are pledging to reduce their emissions, their contribution to emissions, and so are traveling less. But their travel, corporate travel, is what we want as a destination. Right? That provides us with sustainability for our livelihoods. And so if we're going to lose on the one hand from corporate travel, we have to be sure to make it up on the other end from a consumer perspective. If we look at how uh, Dominica aligns with uh, some of these trends, from a biodiversity standpoint, we can see that it attracts significant portion of ecotourists. 73% of travelers consider visiting natural parks and reserves. That's according to UNWTO. And our Montapito National Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, showcases Dominica's biodiversity and natural beauty. Likewise, the story of the Waitikawuli National Trail resonates well with our visitors. According to Booking.com, 87% of global travelers want to travel sustainably. So many of our properties, like Rosalie Bay, Jungle Bay, Fort Young, Hotel, um, Fort Young Hotel, Secret Bay, Coulibry Ridge, to name a few, have great success stories. When you look at uh, utilizing solar or wind power, you look at rainwater habit harvesting, you look at edible landscapes, those epitomize sustainable, sustainable tourism. Sustainable accommodations are preferred by 34% of the global travelers, according to Booking.com. Also, I want to talk a little bit about tailored packages, like a wellness retreat incorporating yoga sessions, hikes, and organic cuisine. 
that will align with the wellness and adventure tourism trend. And according to Global Wellness Institute, wellness tourists spend 130% more than the average tourists. But we must also develop tailored packages for our marine and dive adventure or, and, or, and our co culinary and agro tourism, to name a few. These are instances where we have a competitive advantage. According to Forbes, 84% of consumers value experiences as much as or more than the product. And certainly experiences with our indigenous people, the Kalinago, should be featured. So we must work on our offerings. Likewise, we need to collaborate with airlines for special promotions, making it easier and more affordable for tourists to reach Dominica as accessibility is a major factor for 55% of travelers when choosing a destination. That's according to Focus Right. So marketing Dominica, the Nature Isle, starts with the product and experience offerings. If we were to look at targeting, who do we target? And you can see the list there. Dominica, the Nature Island, strategically targets distinct consumer segments such as adventure enthusiasts, wellness seekers, nature lovers, cultural explorers, even luxury travelers, family vacationers, and sustainable travel advocates. By tailoring marketing approaches to each segment, the island maximizes its appeal and positions itself as a premier ecotourism and adventure destination, aligning with the diverse preferences and interests of travelers seeking unique nature-centric experiences. So those are some of the people that we target. Let's look at the market segmentation. First of all, we can approach it from a geographic perspective, focusing on attracting tourists from nearby regions like the Caribbean, North America, and Europe due to ease of access and shared ecological concern. But, you know, North America is a big place. So we focus on specific islands within the Caribbean, especially where access, we, we tend to say follow the access. And in the US and Canada, we look at places like Miami, the tri-state area, and Toronto to be uh, specific. And in Europe, we focus on countries like France and Germany. From a demographic perspective, we targeting specific age groups interested in eco-friendly travel and adventure, like the millennials or middle-aged individuals. And certainly, we know that target age groups for the French West Indies will be different than the UK will be different than, than the US. And so we need to tailor our messaging uh, to the specific segment that we're going after. Let's look at behavioral, behavioral. Targeting trend, um, travelers who um, enjoy outdoor activities such as hiking, bird watching, or scuba diving, and tailoring packages to match these interests. And lastly, we talk about psychographic, where we talk about lifestyles, tailoring marketing strategies to appeal to environmentally conscious and nature-loving travelers, showcasing Dominica as a pristine and authentic destination. So if we talk about some of the marketing strategies to leverage Dominica, we can design informative, visually appealing websites, showcasing Dominica's natural beauty, eco-friendly initiatives, adventure opportunities and travel packages. We can create landing pages tailored to each target market segment, addressing their specific interests and needs. We can develop content strategy focused on ecotourism, adventure activities, biodiversity, and sustainable travel in Dominica. We can publish blogs articles and guides highlighting unique experiences and attractions to capture the attention of the target audience. We can run social media ad campaigns on platforms like
Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter, um, showcasing our stunning visuals and videos of Dominica's nature-based attractions. Collaborate with eco-travel influencers to reach a wide audience and promote Dominica as a premier nature-focused destination. We can build on the traditional, the email lists, and go out with content on those emails uh, specific to, to those lists. Um, also on the traditional then focusing on things like newsletters and then focusing on SEO, search engine optimization to optimize websites. We can also produce specific videos on topics showcasing the island's diverse flora and fauna. We can utilize platforms like YouTube and social media to reach a broader audience. We can run pay-per-click campaigns on Google Ads, featuring on certain words that are germane to Dominica, like ecotourism and the like, nature island experiences. We can create ad variations for different market segments to tailor messaging accordingly, according to their um, specific um, desires. We also want uh, user-generated content, so we want to encourage visitors to share their experiences on social media using specific hashtags. We can organize contests and giveaways to incentivize sharing and engagement organize virtual tours and webinars, something that we use quite frequently, uh, and ensure that our website is mobile friendly, right, and cater to the users who access information, because increasingly more people are, access, are accessing travel information on their mobile device. And last but not least, I decided to put forth an innovative idea um, and so that would be a cruise ecotourism hub development. And it sounds like an oxymoron, right? Um, but it, whereas, it, I mean, it, it, it couples what, sh what people think is a mass tourism um, initiative being cruise with something that should be more sustainable in terms of low carrying capacity. But I think uh, it's a matter of how we do it um, it can be successfully done based on how we combine the two. And one example I will give is the development of a biopark. That is a concept that if implemented properly, I think can marry these two things and it can provide the benefits. Certainly, um, we look at one of the benefits uh, would be to encourage repeat visits, which would bring about sustainability, but sustainability of a different meaning that of economic development and better livelihood for stakeholders. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Piper, for your presentation. You gave us a very strong foundation to start off looking at the statistics and the numbers behind tourism. And I think that's very important to consider because we often, you know, we see tourism as just what it is on face value. We just look at the visitor arrivals, you know, we see the hotels and so on, but it's good to consider the numbers that, 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 that come from tourism in terms of visitor arrivals and so on. And so we're moving to our next panelist, who is Mr. Sam Raphael, who will be presenting um, to us this evening. Thank you so much and good evening everyone. It's so nice that we don't have to do all the protocol things that the British taught us to do. Huh? Uh, no, I just want to uh, welcome all of you here and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for the invite. This is a very, very interesting and I think timely topic for us to address uh, here in Dominica. I am Sam Raphael as the, is introduced. I am uh, an entrepreneur. That's what I do in the area 
of interest to me is tourism because that's the main interest in my region of the world, which is the Caribbean. That's our main industry. And uh, traditionally, that industry had not been something that our Caribbean people had been deeply involved in from an uh, entrepreneurial perspective. And so I thought it was something that maybe I could try to blaze a path for future generations, create maybe replicable models. And this is what I'll try to talk to you about. A lot of those models involve linkages, a more integrated type of, of tourism development. Um, as I said, largely in the, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, tourism uh, infrastructure is largely foreign owned. Nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that uh, it, because we're all children of this planet. Uh, but in terms of uh, the, 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 the capacity building of the people, oftentimes that is left out because it's not just foreign owned but foreign managed. And traditionally you have uh, the lower end jobs being what's retained by the local people without much opportunity for upward mobility. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Dominica had not been blessed with the type of white sand beaches, flat areas for runways uh, that the other islands have been blessed with. We get too much rain, and so for the tourism brand of the Caribbean, Dominica was not seen as something where it's viable. We were protected by the mountains, uh, we just, it was just too difficult to get to. And so we, as a result, have not had the type of traditional Caribbean tourism infrastructure. Certainly we're not uh, in the f what sun, sand, and sea market. We're not as competitive as some of the other players. Uh, the environmental issues, I, my looking at uh, the beach, on the bottom left, that is, uh, you know, a situation uh, on another jurisdiction, uh, and you can see the environmental degradation that comes with the traditional model of tourism. So, some say, unfortunately, we've not been blessed with this type of mass tourism, but maybe there is some good fortune in that, and it gives us an opportunity uh, to to do it better, to do it in a more sustainable way, uh, with a lot of integration and linkages to the community to foster a more integrated uh, tourism development model. Yeah. So the traditional economic model for hotels in the Caribbean uh, is you get the visitor revenue coming in, that's what we want, whether we get it in accommodations or other services, the spas, the restaurants, etc. And not just in hotels, but in other service providers in, on the island. And then a significant portion of that would go right out towards the importation of additional goods. In a more integrated model, as is being proposed with more linkages, you'd have the visitor revenue. It goes to the hotel and the establishment. And that money would go to the local farmers. It would go to the people that fish. It would go to the people that uh, perform. It would go to the people that produce all of those nice wellness things that we have on this island that we see all these young entrepreneurs producing. It would go round and around. And when you look at economics, uh, a dollar that comes into the economy, that circulates in the economy, is as valuable as a second dollar that comes into the economy. So if we can keep the dollar circulating, that means that we can multiply that dollar sometimes once, sometimes twice, sometimes three times. So indeed, one dollar can work for as three dollars if we find ways to, to keep that circulating. And there's my picture with uh, one of our lawyers turn farm at now turn uh, agritourism uh, entrepreneurs, Kondwani Williams, he was, he was my guest tonight and he was running late because he had to drop the guys off on the farm. And it's very interesting to see some of this we have developing organically 
in Dominica, some of these models that we need to highlight and showcase because sometimes we just need a practical examples, something with a low enough bar that uh, persons can see it work practically and they can try to replicate it. And, and indeed, Kondwani, as well as several other, other persons are indeed creating, developing models that hopefully they can replicate and, uh, and we, can, we can, can have other people continue with and maybe even add some values. So our isolation has indeed created some great opportunities for linkages that some of the other islands maybe don't have as um, maybe as 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 robust as we do. Uh, certainly, um, in terms of the agriculture, food and agriculture, that's one of the. I mean, Dominica is an agricultural economy culturally, even though tourism has surpassed the foreign exchange we got from agriculture in the past, the people are still holding to the soil and the culture of the Dominican people is still, we still an agricultural people, even those of us that don't practice or engage in agriculture on a full-time basis. And there's the isolation provides tremendous opportunities in that. Uh, it provides opportunities in value adding to agricultural products or other manufacturing. And we see a lot of this value adding. I mean, we've had so many examples over the years uh, with uh, the, pr the production of hot sauces, with the production of chips, with the production of sea moss, and I can go on and on and on, where we've had value added uh, um, um, manufacturing to agriculture and also to other products like we see the soaps we see being produced in Dominica, uh, the, 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 the deodorants, you know, the bombs, all of this. We ha even have a wellness association and many of those members produce some, some very high quality things. We have a lot in the arts and crafts, certainly in our Kalanago community. They have certainly been the leader uh, in the production of some high value crafts uh, that, uh, that, that you know, have tremendous value that, that, that persons would want outside of Dominica, visitors would want it. Uh, and uh, certainly even in energy, our isolation, and it gives us um, an opportunity to be innovators in uh, renewable energy, certainly uh, I, uh, we, we have uh, had uh, fossil fuel for a long time that we've been dependent on. I know that uh, we've all uh, been united uh, because of the, the power situation that we've had. We, we, we're not very happy because of that as of late, yeah? I see you all smiling. Um, but it gives us an opportunity on an island like Dominica to be less dependent on fossil fuel because we have, I don't know, any other Caribbean island, Eastern Caribbean island, that have actually hydroelectric energy. And we've had hydro as a major part of our energy uh, infrastructure for years. And we have a potential for solar. Some of the islands, other islands have the potential for solar. But we can be innovative in the way we do it and tie it to the grid. Even we have now geothermal that uh, we've been waiting for for some time. Some people don't like to hear about it, they want to see it, they want to see the geothermal light come on, but we do have tremendous potential in that area. So energy is very important to uh, economic development, and we do have, I think, in Dominica, tremendous potential. And a lot of the other islands, this is, I don't think this is just a Dominica-focused um, um, presentation tonight. So a lot of the other islands, this, this is relevant to them too. And certainly, the isolation gives us an opportunity to build our human resource capacity because, you know, necessity is the mother of innovation. And oftentimes, we have to be creative and come up with stuff uh, when we build, when we, um, when, when we do so many things that we've got to come up with local stuff. Well, 
in the tourism model, certainly, that is relevant to Dominica, that people would want to come to Dominica to enjoy, uh, local is what they want. And it does present tremendous opportunities there. The way forward with respect to, to developing uh, these opportunities is to invest in the capacity infrastructure. And when we say capacity infrastructure, we mean the physical infrastructure and also the human resource capacity infrastructure. We need further investments in agriculture in areas of greenhouses, you know, hydroponics. A lot of young people may feel they don't want to go through the backbreaking agriculture with the pickaxe and the hoe. Well, that is uh, of, of the past. Uh, now you can have very productive agriculture that can be very lucrative on very small areas with other technologies that we need to begin looking at and introducing. Even fishing, for instance, you know, often now in Dominica we have to go out farther and farther to catch fish because the reef fish, uh, we, we, are, we are not a coral island to begin with, but the reef fish that's been close by in many areas have been overfished. And so we need to look at technologies of fish farming, for instance, which is something that is very lucrative. We have a lot of water, and we have a lot of other things that, that we can, both fresh water and salt water, uh, fish farming is things that we can do. Uh, the, certainly the innovation and training of entrepreneurs is critical. And I, my last slide, I'll touch on some of the some of the, 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 the what, what is needed to be successful in, in sustainable tourism, but it's consistent with any type of business. And I think that's something that we often forget. And, and I, I speak over and over to audiences, and there's a reception, but it often doesn't translate into practical, you know, uh, it's, it's not a call to action sometimes. You don't see people getting up and doing it. It sounds good to us, but it's almost as if we're waiting for someone to implement it. And so I'd like to touch on some of the things, especially we have some young people here, that you guys are the future, and to encourage you guys to take up some of, some of, uh, some, some of the information and to, 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 you know, because my generation is fading, our generation is fading, the older ones here and it'll be up to you to, to, to take the baton. So linkages should start from construction to the operation, and I'm speaking of a hotel model. Uh, the reconstruction, and I, I, I've used this model uh, in the development of both the Jungle Bay in the east, as uh, the, the introducers have said, Jungle Bay was established in the southeast of Dominica, and we operated successfully for a period of 10 years. We got struck by a tropical storm that devastated the property. And since then, we've moved to the West Coast. We had 35 rooms in the East, and now we have 89 rooms. So we did something bigger, and some people will say better. Some, I still miss the old Jungle Bay, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, so pre-construction, uh, it's important to get the community involved when you want to talk about just the buy-in. If we say tourism is everybody's business, then we should try to get everyone involved. Certainly you may not get each and every person, but you certainly need sufficient consensus, consensus from a community if you're going to have a successfully community tourism model. Um, you need to inventory your assets and your capacity and the infrastructure that's there. This is very important. Uh, both the human resource capacity and even the, capa the, the infrastructure that's there for sites and trails. When we were in the southeast, we had a pre-opening meeting, and this is early on. We helped to develop an organization called the Southeast Tourism Development Committee, SETDC. And that was basically to pave the way for tourism uh, moving into the southeast because prior to that, there was virtually no tourism in the area. And when we got the community together, and there were literally over 100 people, we asked, what are the interesting aspects of the community that we can do towards that? What? And no one knew. It was, the, we didn't have anything. And then someone said, oh, Victoria Falls. OK, what else? And after a, a, a day of consultation, we had too many things we had to start eliminating. 
you know, glassy pools, you know, and we had Sari Sari also, and we had making the Toloma, which is, you know, which is like the Arrow Root, and we had, you know, the Bay Oil Stills, and all of the heritage things and all of the way of life things were assets that we now just needed to link together to create a very interesting uh, tourism product. Uh, then, uh, the, the, the technology, appropriate technology, is very important. Uh, there was a, uh, just a quick anecdote in Bangladesh. Someone went in from Germany and saw the people hitting stones, you know, thousands of people breaking stones with little chipping hammers. To, it was called a quarry, and that's how they made the stones, you know, old style, you chip it, huh? And everybody got their pile, and then they come and pick up the pile, and that's how the quarry made its money. And he said, well, I can provide you with equipment and you can really make it more profitably. And the owner then went in that direction and they helped build this beautiful quarry. And after a week, there was an upheaval in the community because everyone lost their jobs. Because all the people know what to do is to chip stone. The appropriate technology is to start where the people are and then to build and to train them going forward. And that's one of the things that we did. We took the local guys just fresh off the you know, the old banana farms are fresh off the bay oil stills and took them with cutlass in their hand and started there and, and uh, went forward. You see, I now exhausted my time. But um, again, we go through with the same initiatives on uh, the capacity for farmers and fisher folks, so we helped to develop greenhouses and, and make, make those connections, and they went on way beyond just for Jungle Bay and enabled the supplying of uh, uh, produce and other things for other establishment. So I will end there in respecting the time. I will, I'm sure we have a question and answer so we can talk about some of these things later. Thank you very much, Mr. Raphael, for that uh, very engaging discussion. I really, personally, I appreciated your, your mentioned that necessity is the mother of innovation, invention, and how we can really use our unique selling point as Dominicans beyond the sand and the, and the sun and the sea, the usual things, the typical um, selling points of tourism in the Caribbean. So I think we moved along into a very good area and we're going to go along to the next panelist who is Miss Lizra Fabian, our only lady this evening, so we welcome her. Good evening, everyone. And I'm really delighted to share with you this evening as part of the 40th anniversary of the lecture series of ECCB in Dominica. And I have the privilege to share with you on opportunities in the nature aisle. Now, when we look at opportunities in the nature aisle, we may think of many different things. But a disclaimer, tonight we are going to share on opportunities. But I also think it's going to provoke us to think about different opportunities and maybe help us to innovate based on what Sam was sharing, innovate on the ideas that we have, innovate from where we are right now. But also, the question I want to share with you as we enter this topic is, what should you learn from this? What do you want to learn from it? And what are we going to do with the information that we receive? So at the bottom here, those seen online and those seen here in person, we determine what we do with the information. So as we go into the topic, let's look at what is being shared, but what action can we put forth that we can use the information being shared to change our lives, not just our lives personally, but the lives for others in Dominica. Now, as we enter the topic of opportunities in the nature aisle, and we look at the orange economy and the green economy, I'm just going to share a little bit so that we have some additional context. The video at the beginning gave us some context so that we understand the topic as a whole, but some may wonder, what's the orange economy? And some persons ask me that when I mention, hey, this is what I'm gonna speak, at, or speak about this evening. The orange economy, as you could see here, for those online, and I hope you can actually read it from your seats, it's sharing about the goods and services that have intellectual value. We can see some examples and we'll go through them. They are the product of ideas and expertise of their creators. So this includes design, art, 
music, literature, including poetry, writing, culture, research, science, technology, and media. Now, I want to get a show of hands. And for those online, you could put up your hands if you're, you could like it, you could put a comment in the chat, something that we get to recognize those who operate in the creative industry or in the orange economy. So anyone here this evening operates in the orange economy? We have, okay, the hands are going up. And anyone use services that are being offered within the orange economy? I still see some hands down, but hopefully, I think everybody, right? Some say everyone. So I hope that we can see the connection to the orange economy this evening. Now let's also consider the, the green economy. And it's a result of improved well-being and social equity that we have, reducing the risks from the environment, and also ecological scarcity. It may seem like big words, but let's put it into some brackets of six main sectors. We would have heard of renewable energy, green buildings, sustainable transport, how we use our land, our waste, and our water, how we manage these. So this can help us to think of maybe some of the opportunities, and we getting a bit into it, of the opportunities within the green economy as well. This statistics here, I would say it's, um, it's over a decade. Part of the challenge of what we lack is data that could help us to really understand everything as current as possible. But I just want to give us a picture of the orange economy. And this was shared from, um, that looks at the value of the orange economy, which is $4.3 trillion. And it said that this is about two and a half times the world military expenditure, but also about 20% larger than the German economy at that point in time, which the year I will quote is 2011. That's quite outdated, right? So imagine that everything is advancing. But also when we look at the Americas, and Americas include the US, Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Canada, we saw that it's 1,932 billion. It seems like big numbers. But we could see the comparison of Latin America and the Caribbean. And when we look at Latin America and the Caribbean, the Caribbean is a small portion of that amount. So we could see that the opportunity is wide, but there's still a lot that we could do. And that's why I present to you that the orange economy is a juicy opportunity. Every time you eat an orange, think of it that the orange economy is juicy. So let's explore a little bit more of some of the opportunities within the orange economy. First of all, we have the creative entrepreneurship, digital transformation, and which includes like content creation, digital marketing, our real queen right here. We have event management, cultural tourism, education and training, technology and innovation. And let's go, let's dissect it a little bit more. When we think of creative industries, some may take it as simple and say, oh, these kids, they're always on the phone. They're always just doing this and that. But there are some persons who really use their phones to create content, content for businesses in Dominica. Someone doesn't have to put on a suit and a tie, and if that's what we think of leveraging the opportunities, it's very different than that. We could be anywhere, and we could be using our ideas and our thoughts and creating value from this. So it includes our artists, our designers, our photographers, our musicians and writers. And sometimes we, we don't even think of poetry as a, a big, income earner, but in other parts of the world too, poetry can even be explored, even writing. Because some persons now, I think it's a really great opportunity that we are now able to create books, write books, using the information that's relevant to us within the Caribbean and within Dominica. I'm seeing over the past five years, mothers, Children, there's a young girl, Corinne, maybe some of you have heard of her, in Trinidad and Tobago. She was only five years and she published five books at five years, five years of age. That means that it's not impossible that we can use our skills and talents to advance our ability to take advantage of the opportunities. We also spoke about content creation in digital marketing and how we could use social media and Mr. Piper mentioned about search engine optimization and using the tools that are available, what companies are using 
to present their business to the world, we can leverage these as opportunities to showcase what we have in Dominica. There's also on the events management, and considering the time, I will go through quickly, but after, we could ask questions and we could explore some a little bit more. We are now in the, the Creole season, and we often think of October, November as the busiest time. Some also think of Carnival as the busiest time as well, so February, March, October, November. But there are also other events that we could leverage to bring persons to Dominica. It doesn't have to only be a fete. There could be other things, such as wellness tourism, collaborating with um, the likes of Sam, and bringing persons to Dominica and creating experiences so that they could have in Dominica. We go out to different conferences, but we could bring the conferences here. And those of us who have the influence to share, why don't we have it in Dominica? By doing that, maybe the air access could improve a bit because we actually have more demand for coming to Dominica. And I think, Mr. Piper, you could confirm if we have more demand, then that will help us to attract more, right? We see the nod on his head, so <laughs> that's right. Um, this is also one of the reasons why I've started this, well, part of the progressive mind, which I do, we have Progressism, which is a New Year event, trying to create a new type of event that have a gap in Dominica, where we bring together professionals, and hopefully we can attract persons across the region to come to Dominica for this event. And I hope that January next year will be that opportunity. There's also cultural tourism, where we're able to even leverage our Kalinago craft to create more business opportunities and, and linking the craft sector, not just the Kalinago craft, and I must say that, um, DACPA will not forgive me if I just consider Kalinago craft as the only craft in Dominica, because we have a lot of opportunities to, to leverage cultural tourism. But also education, training, and technology. But I want to move on to share with you an experience, some experiences I've had. Now, on the left side, we see visual arts. On the right side, there's performing arts. And this evening, we're sharing thoughts that will provoke, provoke us to action based on whatever we do with the information. So on the left side, in visiting Colombia, they have invested a lot into having artists as an integral part of the society. So almost every street that you go on, everything seems artistic. So when a tourist goes to, let's say, Cartagena, you look online as to what are the activities to do, you get tours being offered to view art that's in the community, so you have a walking tour of the art. And even in the example of, Medi of Medellin, where Pablo Escobar was high on, he had a, a reputation for what happened in that community, but they intentionally decided that they're going to change how the community looks. They invested in art, so now you have lots of persons using art, music, dance, visual arts, as an outlet to help the young people to develop socially, but also create other business opportunities for their residents. On the right side, this is one of the, the most interesting parts I want to share that in Bali, one of the things that they have is called the kekak dance, or kekak dance. And this kekak dance, I could not understand the language. Most foreigners who come there, which would be over thousands of tourists every day, cannot understand what they're saying. But they have a nice poster that describes exactly what's happening in English, so though you can't understand, you still get an experience to follow through by reading something so you can get to understand the, the story behind it. How do you may say how this applies to Dominica? When I grew up, we had Tim Tim Boashish. How many of you heard about Tim Tim Boashish? And maybe for those of you online, if you know Tim Tim Boashish joke, you can put it in the chat so that we can follow. Those on MO News, you could put it there so that we could review after. But imagine if we have a place in Dominica that we can leverage a beautiful view of the sunset. And this could probably even be at um, Mon Bruce. At that point, we develop it a bit, landscaping, maybe put some pillows down, and persons come there at evening time. And the tourists who come to Dominica on the cruise ship, they could come and hear something about Tim Tim Boashesh or, or some of our jokes that we've had before. And they get a cultural, immersive experience that's like no other across the region. What do you think of that idea? Would you actually go to it? Okay, I, I heard yes. 
I know my time is going quickly. <laughs> so I want to share too that there's some opportunities that we can leverage from Africa. Africa is one of our, well, we are diasporas, right? Diasporans of Africa as well. And I think we underestimate the value of what we can learn from there and also trying to link it to our history and being able to create money from this. Now, even looking at how Africa has developed their creative sector, they've invested intentionally millions and billions into creating jobs. So it's not a, a by the way idea, it's not a, a secondary thought. It's really been intentional as a country that we want to create jobs in this sector, so we're really going to do this to move them forward. There are opportunities also within the green economy, and probably when we get to the question and answer, I have more to show on that, so I will save it for then, right, Anika? The green economy, there are also some opportunities, and I will have them on the screen so that we get to keep it in our minds a bit as we move to question and answer. But there are opportunities in sustainable agriculture, which includes fishing and aquaculture. Some mentioned hydroponics, and we have to look at creative ways of moving agriculture from breaking your back in the sun, in the hot dirt, on our hills, climbing over the valleys. I really cannot go to Tibosh and, and spend time like this like my grandfather did before, right? But we also have nature-based opportunities, which includes education, culinary experiences, and also accommodation. But building on this, we could develop our journalism to also be environmental journalism and media, not just the traditional reporting on something that exists. I don't want to call out some media houses, but maybe some of the things that we share as, as media or media influencers on social media could actually be valuable content that could actually change lives. And also ecotourism, nature-based theme-guided tours, education and training, and technology and innovation. These are also opportunities. But in closing, this is a major slide that I have, where I want to present that we see these as opportunities, but what's next? They are opportunities, yes, but how can we achieve them? We have to have a mindset of collective consciousness, like Pep would say at Creed. How can we change the idea to be more resilient? or we can take advantage of the orange economy and not think of our mindset. We need to change our mindset in order to adapt to these. Some mentioned about education and also access to education and resources. We also need to foster that culture of innovation where we also build strong support system and an enabling environment. If a business in the creative sector decides, I want to do this, what is the supporting system to help move this forward? but also encouraging collaboration, recognizing and rewarding achievement. And I've always had this thought about, how can we have a poet laureate in Dominica? We saw the young lady in the US, when she gave her poem, you just saw her page light up and she had a million followers in less than a few minutes. How can we create these opportunities for our young persons? But what happens from here depends on you and it depends on me. And I want to leave with you that Will you take action to leverage one opportunity today? If you will, can I see your hands? I hope you will. No force, no pressure, but thank you very much. Thank you, Lizra, for that really engaging um, presentation. You presented so many concrete ideas and steps that we can take to, to really leverage the opportunities in the orange and green economies. You gave us so much context um, you, you know, you really set the basis for understanding what exactly the orange and green economies are and how we can use them to our advantage in a unique way in Dominica. So we're moving to our next panelist, which is Mr. Ken George Dill, as he makes his presentation. I'd like to say good evening to my fellow presenters and the audience. For a number of years, I have been telling myself and others that boredom is a state of mind. So I'm asking you, the audience tonight, to embrace that philosophy wholeheartedly while you listen to me trying to struggle through this presentation. <laughs> the forum objectives as stated by the ECCB is that the event in Dominica hopes to achieve critical reflection on ways in which Dominica's uniqueness can be used for economic development. 
and I was asked to speak on sites, treasures, and pleasures. I actually believe that all three are conjoined. With this in mind, I will highlight some of the unique aspects of Dominica. Some are already being used for economic benefits, but can be enhanced to achieve greater results. I will elaborate on some things more because I believe they are the core aspects or features which determines who we are in Dominica and which enable us to use the term nature island of the Caribbean. My time will not allow me to be as thorough as I would like to be unless you extend my time. But I will try to exercise brevity in my presentation with a hope to highlight the quintessence of what defines Dominica as a unique tourism destination. One of my favorite analogy is that we have in abundance naturally what many others create artificially and market successfully. I will also highlight some of our challenges and impediments. Some challenges affect us in our efforts to market the destination. But challenges should not be seen as a negative. They're just things to overcome. And one of the challenge, a couple of the challenges I'm going to mention here are inadequate financial resources for advertising, refurbishing, marketing, and promotion. And later on, I will say a little bit on that about the National Trail. But also a lack of educational initiatives to create a national awareness of, importance, of the importance of protecting or national resources such as our water and our rainforest, two aspects of the island which makes us not only unique but exceptional and exotic in our region. Highlighting the uniqueness of Dominica, our rainforest and its connection to the ecosystem, the Kalinago people, water, rivers and waterfalls, Marine activities such as diving and whale watching, hiking, bird watching, and the Waitakubuli National Trail, which can be, like many people go to Nepal because they want to hike to the top of Mount Everest. We can create a situation where we have people come to Dominica to hike the Waitakubuli National Trail, but right now it's a mess. What is special about rainforest? And I'm going to highlight on rainforest a little bit more than some other things because of, I, I consider it to be one of the most unique features that we have in Dominica. Rainforests are rich in biodiversity and are incredibly important to our well-being. Rainforests help us to regulate our, our climate and provide us with medicines and raw materials. I'm not saying this, the experts are saying that rainforest recycles at least 32% of the precipitation it receives. So you will have an understanding of how important it is to the continuity of our water cycle. Um, I'm not, how do you do the clicker here now? Huh? Oh, oh somebody's doing it for me, sorry. Rainforests are an indispensable part of providing us with an abundance of fresh water, which sometimes we take for granted, as in evidence, as how we sometimes abuse our water sources, our resources. Rainforests and medicine. I don't know if you, any of you recall in the days when HIV AIDS were, was rampant, they actually discovered a plant in the rainforest of Dominica called the Clusia, which was supposed to be used in experimental treatment for the cure of HIV AIDS. The Cancer Institute has identified 3,000 plants which are active against cancer cells. 70% of them are found in rainforest. 25% of the active ingredients 
ingredients in today's cancer fighting drugs come from organisms found in rainforest. Vincristine and vinblastine, which is found in the Madagascar, Madagascar periwinkle, is used in the treatment of leukemia. That is how important the rainforest is to us. And not many islands in the region can compete with Dominica in terms of the integrity of our rainforest. We have three national parks for a small country. We have the Mourntwapita National Park, which is 17,000 acres by international standards as a drop in the bucket. But that 17,000 acres represents about 9% of Dominica's land area. And some of the most interesting places of interest are located within the Mourntwapita National Park. Then we have the Mourn Diablo National Park, which was created specifically for the preservation of our two endangered parrots. And then we have the historic Cabritz National Park. So those are some of the, the treasures that we have. Okay. I want to talk now about our water. Every year, lack of safe water and proper sanitation result in 2 million child deaths and 443 million missed days of school. Half of all hospital beds in, develop, in the developing world are filled with people sick from waterborne diseases. More people die from diarrhea and from unsafe water and poor sanitation than in armed conflict. Fortunately in Dominica, we are still able to drink safely from our water up in the mountains. Globally, over half a billion people face water shortages. The shortage of water is going to be one of the greatest challenges that the world will be facing in the future. Dominica is blessed. I'm going to highlight some of our activities which attract people to the island and which people come to Dominica for those activities. The T2 Gorge is one of the most unique places in Dominica. I, I like to describe it as a waterfall inside a cavern and you have to swim to it. And I have traveled and done things extensively in the region. And there's just one place in the Caribbean that I have seen that is a little bit like T2 Gorge and it is found in Martinique. It's called Gorge de la Falaise, but Dominica is better. <laughs> we have the Midland Falls, we have the Jaco Falls, we have the Freshwater and Bury Lake, we have the Emerald Pool and the Kalinago Village. And I want to spend some time talking a little bit about the Kalinago Village. Because Dominica is the only island in the region where you have the indigenous people whom the Europeans met when they came living together as a group. We at CATS, we have tried to encapsulate the quintessence of what that means into an activity we call the Kalinago Experience, where we go there and we spend a day with a group of people using the services of a number of the Kalinago people, talking about their way of life, what they do for a living, their handicrafts, how it is made, how they prepare what they use to make the handicraft, for example, the laumwa, which they cut in the mountains, and the way they're able to naturally make different colors out of it, that experience. Then we have a farmer talking about um, what he does with the things he grows, how he spends the money educating his children, and how he plants these things, how long they take to grow. You, you'll be surprised how fascinated people are listening to things like that. Someone, one of the presenters mentioned the Sari Sari and the Victoria Falls. Those are two of our very unique waterfalls. They're challenging to get to, but they are unique and they're very, very special. Then we have the Syndicate Rainforest, which we do. It's mainly, it's a good area for bird watching. 
but it is also one of the most easily accessible areas where somebody can go and have a, a visitor can go to and have a very good experience of a tropical oceanic rainforest. And maybe I should differentiate between the difference between a mainland rainforest and a tropical rainforest. An oceanic rainforest is rainforest that is found on an island. The mainland rainforests which are found like in South, and South America and Africa, they are bigger, they have bigger trees and they have more wildlife. So the forum asked us to identify or asked me to identify some of the unique features on the island which can be utilized for income generation. I have identified some of those features. But for national income generation, there must be a national effort involving the public sector and the private sector stakeholders. I, as an individual, can make contributions according to my own observations and perceptions. But there must be a national consensus based on consultation with stakeholders. And this national consensus must be what guide and direct us to do what is best for Dominica. Sustainability cannot be achieved in the absence of a national development strategy and a clear and um, unambiguous polity. And I do mean polity, not policy. So, assessing what we have to do. We have to design and create multi-tiered packages from the unique features which the island has in abundance. We have to thoroughly understand this product to be able to describe it accurately, all aspects of the product, pricing the product competitively, manage the product, identifying target markets, choose mediums of distribution, and choose methods of distribution. And we have to be prepared. One of the things we have to keep in mind that before a visitor comes to a destination, that person would have spent several thousand dollars. So he has a different expectation of what he wants to see or what he wants to get. And that expectation would be very different from when he's going down to the supermarket to buy fish because he spends a lot of money. The airfare alone is high. So we have to be able to satisfy that expectation. And for us to do that, we have to be prepared. We have to have well-trained and certified employees. We have to have people who can give accurate information, not just make up something. You know, <laughs> I, I'm going to give you a joke. Um, I, I, did, I, I hope I'm not running out of my time. I, I did um, a tour with a gentleman once. And he said to me, I want you to tell me the proper names of the plants in the forest. I don't want you to make up some mumbo jumbo name like the guy who took us to the boiling lake. So that is why it is so important that whatever services we're offering, the information that we give is accurate and not challengeable. Because once, it is challenge, once your, the information that you give is challengeable, then you lose credibility. And once you're losing credibility, you eventually will lose your market share. So we also have to be aware of what I'm done, and just quickly. We also have to be aware of what our competitors are doing. We have to look at what they're offering, what are the demographics that they're offering to, and what are their marketing strategies, and what is the cost that they're offering their products. And it means that we must be aware of what they're doing so we can be ahead of the game. And I apologize for overstaying, over presenting. But my last thing is that we can only achieve success if we unite. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Gail. That just goes to show you there's so much to talk about. It's a never-ending discourse, Dominica. It's so dynamic, so unique, that we could literally stay here until tomorrow discussing all of the opportunities that we have. So we're going to move swiftly to our final presenter, by no means all least, Mr. McCarthy Murray. Ben, bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, content là pas tellement long que nous que puis pour faire ça passer en anglais tout de suite. So good evening ladies and gentlemen. So that everybody you can understand clearly what I'm saying including those who are here and those who are watching and listening at home switch to English. So I'm speaking about the orange economy. And I suppose the first question you'd ask is why is it orange? Well, the, the name Orange Economy was first popularized by the Inter-American Development Bank, IADB, on the basis that the color orange signified creativity and dynamism. Yes, so what is the definition of the cultural, of the orange economy? The orange economy is essentially what is otherwise known as cultural industries and there are different definitions of cultural industries. UNESCO has one, UNDP has a slightly different one, but the one I like and the one I think that's gaining international acceptance, I would say, is the one given by the British Arts Council which says, and I'll read it out for you, you can also read it there, Cultural or creative industries are those industries which have their origin in individual creativity, skill, and talent, which have a potential for job and wealth creation through the production, through the generation, sorry, and exploitation of intellectual property. And the two main intellectual properties which are underpinning the creative industries or the orange economy is to copyright, firstly, trademark, secondly, and thirdly, geographical indications. Yes, I won't go into what those are, but just accept that. These industries, however, or additionally, are also the same industries that the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, in its guide on measuring the contribution of copyright industries to countries' economy, referred to as the core copyright industries, yes? So there is a bit of overlap between the two. So, Dominica happens to be in a particularly interesting position with the respect to the orange economy. For this reason, that Dominica, as far as I know, is the only country in CARICOM that actually has a measurement of the contribution of the orange economy to our well-being in Dominica. And the statistics I'm preparing, presenting here tonight were gathered by Mr. Craig Stedman, who was at the time an employee of the Dominica Export-Import Agency, and I worked with him to put that together. So in 2011, these are the figures that were collected. Okay, with respect to employment, 4% of total employment in Dominica was generated by the cultural industries or the orange economy. And the number of jobs was estimated at 1,000 1, full-time and part-time jobs. Yes? Okay, so how did that break down between the different sectors of the orange economy? The arts and crafts section, sector, or cluster, 
employed 101 persons, of which 93 were full-time workers. You see, 92% of the people in the arts and craft industries did that as their main source of income. 57% of these persons were female, so the arts and craft industry is dominated by females. And 43%, of course, were males, because there are no other genders, although some people have a binary gender, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we didn't measure those. Then we had another cluster, which is the music cluster. And we had 147 persons in that cluster, of which 79% were full-time, meaning that that was the major activity that they undertook to gain their livelihood. They might also do other work, but that's the main livelihood. So 20% were part-time. And the music industry, or the music cluster, accounted for 15% of the employment in the orange economy. Then we had the film and audiovisual sector. Here they are, audio and visual. Right. So there were 45 workers in that cluster, of which 31% were full-time. And the balance were, of course, part-timers who did that usually on the weekends or after their main activity for gaining their livelihood. So that's employment. The contribution to the gross value added in 2011 went something like this. Arts and craft accounted for let me read it here. Arts and Craft accounted for EC $1.4 million, or 9% of the total value added, or added of the creative industries or the orange economy. The music cluster accounted for EC $1.392 million, or 8.36%. The audiovisual and performing arts jointly contributed 482,833 dollars, or 2.64%. The multimedia and literature cluster accounted for the largest share, and that was $13.52 million, or 80% of gross value added. And this cluster included, besides the obvious writing of books and those sorts of things, included radio, television, and online publication. And they, these last ones I named out for you here, in this cluster, multimedia, contributed 88% of the multimedia section. So radio, television, and online publication were 80 8% of the multimedia and literature cluster, okay? And this is the orange economy in Dominica in full swing. Merci. We are waiting your questions. I will expand on whatever need to be expounded on. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Murray. I know for myself, I can say, probably like many others, I, before I knew what intellectual property rights were, I knew Mr. McMurray, and I knew that you had to be very careful with intellectual property rights um, before I even understood the concept. So I thank you for your contribution as well in terms of allowing Dominican populists to understand intellectual property rights a bit more in depth. <clears throat> so at this point, we are going to move swiftly into the question and answer segment. We've heard a number of presentations. They've been very thought-provoking. 
um, quite in depth. And I think there is room for, I know for our online platform, we are getting a lot of questions through there. Uh, but at this point, we are going to open the floor to our in-house audience for those members who would like to ask any questions. So any or all members of the panel. Sure, if you'd like to identify yourself, we'd appreciate that. Hi, good evening all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Florian. Um, just a few questions. So, um, good evening, Mr. Viper. Um, you may mention the need for understanding the trends, sustainable tourism. Uh, my specific area of concern is, have we did any research in terms of the indigenous aspect of sustainable tourism? And what are the hindrances of unlocking that? Um, but we speak about sustainable tourism, then we have the indigenous. So I have, I have a few questions, so let me just ask all. Um, also, Mr. Sam, um, you made mention of the integrated approach, which uh, uh, fosters local entrepreneurship. To me, it speaks to green, orange, um, and the likes. Um, my question to you is, what do you think are the hindrances in achieving the full potential of the integrated approach you spoke to. Right? You made mention of Pondani buying our local produce. The, the dollar earned and generated locally has a great economic value. So, okay. Um, and also, Ms. Fabian, you spoke of the orange economy. Um, so, what do you think are the entry points? I mean, you made mention of arts and the likes, but what do you think are the critical, critical entry points for us that we could focus on? Because it would imagine having to look at all the areas, you need a certain level of infrastructure to do that in terms of finances, but what do you think are the entry points? And Mr. Deal, uh, marketing appears to be something that you made mention of, and what do you think um, should we focus on? Because you said marketing, it appears we have the natural products, but we have some form of discrepancy or challenges in marketing. And what would be your recommendation in how could we unleash or market what we have? I think those are my four areas. Okay, so what we're going to do is just have you repeat each question again. Um, so I'll have you repeat, repeat the question to Mr. Piper and we'll give him an opportunity to respond. Okay, so Mr. Piper, read the indigenous experience. How can we unlock it? I mean, we heard of sustainable tourism, but the indigenous aspect of tourism, the Kalinago experience, how do we unlock the true potential of that? Well, I, I think that, thank you for your question. I think that what we need to do is really package the experience, uh, and by that I mean make it very accessible to people who want to come and experience that, because it is a great experience. It's something that is unique, and as um, was mentioned previously, People are going beyond just a product now, but to an experience. And so I think that if we can package the experience, like Ken spoke about, you know, a day in the life of, and you can have people um, participate in that, that these are some of the things that can happen. So in order to package, you need the product, you need the experience, you need the activity. Um, there needs to be an entity, typically that's a tour operator, so Kent himself and his company, something like that. Others within, the, um, uh, within Dominica can do the same thing, uh, but we need to make it accessible. Uh, and beyond that, uh, once you have it, you have to let people know that you have it and that it can be experienced, so you have to market and promote it. And so we can do that again through the various um, methods. Uh, the digital space, social media probably being one of the most, um, uh, or one of the fastest growing at this point in time. So my question so is just the integrated um, system that you mentioned. A local dollar generated has great economic value. Um, what do you think are the hindrances of growing what we consume what we that is my rationale there. And do you think we need a renewing of the mind to achieve that? Do we need a what? Renewing of the mind to achieve the integrated approach. A renewing of the, the mind. mind. Renewing of the mind. Okay, yes. Uh, it, it, the answer is simple. We just need people that are prepared 
that are focused, that are determined. Uh, you know, it's like ready, willing, and able to step forward and do it. At the end of the day, that's what it takes. I mean, you don't want to encourage people who have not adequately prepared themselves to go forward to do it. But at the end, we need people from the community that will step up to the challenge. And I think, quite frankly, that that's what's generally lacking. We're afraid to take risks. Uh, we, you know, culturally, we, 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 we are hesitant at doing these things. And it's just people need to feel comfortable and step up and do it. And yes, we need a renewing of the conversations. We need a renewing of the mind. We need a renewing of focus. Uh, if we're going to foster a new generation of entrepreneurs that will step up and take advantage of the potential that's there. Mr. Fabian, it's just the entry points. I know you mentioned a few areas, but I mean, given our limited resources, um, population, what do you think are, your, are the key entry points to the orange economy? Great. I think that's a, a really great question. And it depends on who's asking that question, right? <laughs> because it depends on your age, depends on your location, your, your budget, and your interests, your knowledge as well and skill. It, it really determines which area may seem as a low-hanging fruit. But for an example, there are some youth in the audience understanding about digital transformation because the world is heading in that direction and we're really lacking in that area in Dominica. I think educating ourselves on what is needed and there are some good practices in Dominica. Israel together with the government of Dominica looked at Fiverr, Upwork and really helping to skill our youth in how we can work online and leverage some of these tools that we have. And I think just try and putting ourselves out there to learn YouTube. I mean, people think that it's just another thing that people say, but YouTube have a wealth of information. And if we look on some other sites, we can get a lot of information to help us. It would be remiss of me if I didn't say use ChatGPT as well to help you to better create content so that you could have a business. I mean, that's what people use in other parts of the world. And I think we can use it as well. But another low hanging fruit is in the communities. And someone may be 50 years, 60 years, and they think, what can I do with the, the orange economy? I think, starting with an idea, those who can speak Creole and know Tim Tim Boashesh, like I really cannot give a joke in that, <laughs> but somebody else may be able to, and working along with a youth who can use digital transformation can help as a low entry point. But we cannot do it by ourselves, it has to be an enabling factor. Final thing I would say on this, I know I'm taking up a little bit more time, but it's important that the facilitators in Dominica work along with the people who have the interest for that. So even if some persons in the community and you say, this is what we want to do, but if there's not a focus on that on a national level, on the enablers like the small business, um, small business support unit, or even NDFD, the different organizations who enable businesses in these areas, then I think we would have a gap. We need to come together. This is a good start, but we need something intentional if we're saying, how can we leverage the opportunities in the orange economy for the advancement of Dominica, have a plan and work towards it as collaborators. And I think tonight Lizra has already introduced the, the quill tourism um, opportunity, so we can, I'm sure we can also identify a number of areas for growth in that, in that um, sector. Okay, so for Mr. Dill, I mean, he made mention of marketing. I know we we'll spend a significant amount of money on marketing um, Dominica, ecotourism product. Yeah. So I'm um, not too sure where the lack in is, so probably if he could yes. expand yes. a bit more. Yes. And I love your concept of environmental um, preservation. That's my field. So kudos for you for mentioning that. All right. uh, in terms of marketing, the, the tourism product is, is varied. So you have to have a target market, which is relevant to the specific product that you're marketing. Then you have to look at your budget. And there, there are different ways in which you can market it based on your budget. If you could just put the mic a bit closer, Mr. Dill. Turn it towards him. Hold it to him. To, to, okay. You, the, the tourism product is very varied. So you have to have a target market because not everything fits for everybody. So you have to look at what sector people are you marketing to? Where are they located? Then you have to look at your budget. For example, what can you afford? Um, there, there are several things. You can attend trade shows. You can do website marketing. You can do print marketing, which is almost going out of style now. But the important thing is you, you must know your product. 
And once you know your product and you have identified the, the, the target market, so, so what, once you have identified the target market, then you, you make the decision where you want to go based on your budget. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and this, is a, this, this conversation that we're having this evening, I'm going to call it a conversation because it's not an us and them, it's, or them and us, it's, it's all of us together. Um, I do recognize that one of the questions that came from our online, um, <clears throat> our online chat examines what policies needs, need to be adopted to put a handle on throwing garbage from moving vehicles. So I would like to invite, um, you know, in the spirit of it being dynamic, if we have any contributions from the audience, for, from members who may have um, expertise in that area. Sure. <laughs> All right, sorry, it just goes with the job. Um, so one of the areas that we've noticed where environmental preservation is concerned, Dominica, enforcement is not our strong suit. Um, and we've been having discussion in trying to improve enforcement. Even today we had a meeting. Um, re, um, the, what's, what's it? the Creole at, at, in the gardens and one of the things I, I admit mention of the police, are they going to monitor people littering within the, the public space? Because we, we, we definitely have a challenge there. Um, tomorrow we shall be reviewing the environmental bill. So we shall see that rolling out soon. And some of the elements in terms of littering, um, we have a draft little bill um, on any works. Uh, it is a bit more stringent. Um, we hope that once it's approved, if you're caught littering, we will not charge you $25. We'll give you a grease suit and ask you to clean a mile. So we think those deterrents will help us improve um, on the littering issue that we're experiencing currently in the island. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell, for your contribution. Uh, so at this point, we're going to... Oh, we have someone who would like to... Con Mr. Murray. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a comment, uh, somewhat of a general comment. Many people who made mention before me, who spoke before me, of innovation and digital technology, etc. And um, Ms. Fabian mentioned, should use chat GPT, right, which I suspect everybody here knows and they use it already. Uh, but somebody also mentioned training. And I think innovation and training go hand in hand. We ought to be teaching our children in primary school to write computer code. Because if you can't write computer code in the 21st century, you are effectively illiterate. And the world is running away from us on that score. For example, we are in the tourism business and pretty much everybody here, at least at the table, I assume, use a computer to manage his or her business. However, the computer program that runs there is not made by a person in Dominica. So although Sam mentioned that we should be, in point of fact, trying to have minimum leakages from the tourism dollar that comes in, because we are not, if you like, conscious of the fact that there are people here who ought to be and who can write a computer code to run a 50-room hotel, that's not really difficult. We ought to do that. And secondly, with respect to government procurement, the government is in the process, some years now, of digitizing their activities. They're writing different programs, for example, the program to keep track of births and deaths. It's a simple database that people here I know who write computer programs could write. So part of the, somebody asked about policy, they asked about policy in a different context. However, I would say governmental policy in procurement of digital services should prioritize Dominican citizens who have the skill, which means the government also has a responsibility to make sure that the population is properly educated to be able to deliver the services. And because the other thing with the procurement is that when the government procures these services 
from a local program or a local firm of foreign services. He builds the skill in the society so that people will see who are outside that it's worth my while to go to the college and learn to write computer programs because there are jobs that are available that pay pretty well. I just, that's what I wanted to say there. Thank you. Yes, and I think that also that point also goes pretty well in terms of how do we keep that dollar circulating through our economy? Because if we have local programmers, then we can also, you know, keep that, that revenue stream throughout our, our populace. So we have a question in the audience. All right, I have, my name is uh, Bernard Ito. Um, just full disclosure, I'm the political leader of the Dominica Freedom Party. I have a few questions, well, more comments um, on, the, on the program. Let me first say I am very happy to see that sort of uh, forum being set up. I think we need much more policy-oriented discussions than political discussions. So my congratulations and my good wishes to the organization, ECCB, and all the panelists, all the folks that I know well and respect very well. Um, but I do have a few comments that I would like to make about um, you know, our, our strategy when it comes to leveraging our assets, the Niche Island assets, to becoming what we should be aspiring to become a first world nation based on those unique assets. Um, it seems to me we are a little bit incoherent often because we talk about developing a, a, a pristine, targeted, niche, experience-based ecotourism product. But often you will hear other conversations, for example, we need to build golf courses. In fact, the recent conversation about golf courses in pristine, sacred, urban green spaces, which is completely incoherent to developing the, the image of a very focused ecological uh, program. And we also do things like we destroy hundreds of acres of pristine rainforest to create the world's longest strand. Um, not realizing that the people we're targeting do pay attention to those things, like the depletion of the catchment areas that probably is re result in the, in the uh, Domlek problem because we have depleted hundreds of acres in the Loda area, depleting those water catchment areas. We, we, are, we have to be pay attention to those things because the people we are targeting do pay attention. They want a comprehensive ecological mindset. They do not want a veneer a facade of ecological consciousness. They want to truly know that Dominicans, and we should become deeply conscious and deeply embracing of a philosophy of ecological uh, wellness. Not just wellness of the environment, which is very important, but wellness of the society. And so we have to make sure that we have those things integrated. Because we simply cannot focus on the beauty of the island and frankly ignore a lot of the ugliness of the society that is inhabiting the island. So when you cohabit beauty, natural beauty, with a certain level of social ugliness, you have again an incoherent approach to development and that is something that we must focus on. Again, folks will not become fooled by a facade of pristine physical beauty with social ugliness. The other issue with this social ugliness is that you cannot isolate the tourism product from that for very long. It will inevitably spill and corrupt and degrade. It only takes a few nasty incidents based on frustration and desperation of the society to ruin decades of work of marketing us as a friendly ecological nation. And so you must integrate the social development and the economic opportunities with the physical marketing in order to truly have a sustainable uh, product. I agree with the presenters that we cannot execute these initiatives well without the correct infrastructure. But we often focus on the physical infrastructure, which is important, but we must make sure that the socio-political infrastructure is also available. In fact, in my opinion, that is the infrastructure that really makes it difficult for us to leverage our Nature Island product. What does a social, social political infrastructure look like? It is high quality, high integrity governance and leadership at all levels. If you do not have that, your initiatives will continue to flounder. 
your plans, your, your marketing, everything that you want to do, if not based on that infrastructure for good, strong, socio-cultural infrastructure, you will flounder. So we must focus on that. And we must then develop that and select leaders who can execute and deliver that. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is the orange economy we know is also the economy of ideas, creativity, innovation. That requires us to focus on developing a technocratic society. That means you must select people for the job based on ability only. Not connections, not uh, preferences, not your pet ideas, but in order to have an orange economy that flourish, the person who can do the job, whether you like him or not, he is the best programmer in the island, he should do the job, and that is the sort of technocratic-based approach to leadership and to our society that we must have if any orange economy is going to take root. So we must have this, and we must have leaders who are comfortable living in the world of ideas, living in the world of technology. This is the 21st century, we need 21st century leaders, and we need people who can take those ideas and execute technical projects and understand at the highest level what it takes to uh, execute those. So I'll just say, that's my comments, and anyone can feel free to respond. But these are the things that we truly need, the substructure, if you will, of what it will take for us to truly leverage what is an incredibly incredible product but to truly leverage it, we need that socio-political infrastructure to be addressed as a critical need. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and contribution. I'm not sure if any member of the panel has any remarks that they'd like to make. Mr. Mr. Dill, you can just use the microphone and just put it close to your mouth. My, my remark is directed to the ECCB organizers. Um, we, we are here now, this is sort of like we have started something. Um, based on the presentations that you have heard, where, where do we go from here? Are we going to look at the, the recommendations, the suggestions, and then come up with a plan? I agree. While I am not an ECCB organizer myself, what I can say is I think that we've had a lot of dynamic ideas come from this presentation and it may serve us well perhaps to compile them and perhaps to present them to the relevant bodies in terms of all of the ideas that were captured. We had a lot of recommendations coming, um, concrete recommendations coming from even Lizro, for example. So that may indeed serve us well. Yeah, because you know, it, it would be a shame for this just to be an exercise where we come and talk about something and then nothing happens after that. Yes, but as, and as Lizro did mention, it's you and me. So I think the onus is on all of us to move it forward and to mobilize all of these ideas. Um, but we, we certainly is uh, an area that we should consider for collecting and gathering all of the information that has been presented and presenting it whether to the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Environment, because these are all, on, honestly, um, very good ideas. So Mr. Piper, I'm asking you to be a protagonist in, in moving all of these ideas forward. <laughs> so probably, um, Anika, I could comment on this as well, because um, Ms. Shema, the ECC, we also have the, where the stakeholders across the region come together every year. And this also includes all different types of stakeholders, including religious leaders, educational, like academic, private sector, Chamber of Commerce, Brenton, where all the partners come together. And we share ideas on how we can enhance the ECCU. Now, I think in all the different countries, ideas would have come forth, but this could create a new line of enhancing the ECCU as a collective body by taking all the ideas like you mentioned, synthesizing them, and looking at what plan, and integrating it with these other events and, and opportunities so it's not just isolated. This as one in all the countries as one, but merging everything together. And um, with the last presenter, the last contributor, I do like some of the ideas that you mentioned in terms of the, the technocratic society, because we do need persons with the, the skills to be able to move these ideas forward. And there are a lot of persons who see themselves as idea generators, but we also need persons to implement the ideas. So mm -hmm. 
being part of the solution is something I think we need to be more of in Dominica because we talk a lot <laughs> and not everyone works towards implementing. But if we can help to create a society that implements and we don't see it as they need to do that, but what can I do to create a solution, I think we'll have a better society. Thanks. Thank you very much for your contribution, Israel. And um, we have another um, contribution from our audience, Mrs. Piper. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, this is an excellent initiative by the ECCB on a very pertinent topic, so congratulations to the ECCB. Um, my name is Suzanne Piper, and I, I'm here representing the National Bank of Dominica Limited. And my question is on thought leadership. Um, Dominica seems to be well aligned with the ecotourism and sustainability realm. Are there any efforts toward establishing and leveraging Dominica as a thought leader to assist in our awareness efforts? I know that we are a small country, but not too long ago, our declaration that we want to be the first climate resilient country in the world caught international attention. Is there an opportunity for Dominica to be a thought leader to gain global awareness, whether it's through sustainability or using local resources for medicine, for example. And any one of the panel members can um, comment on that, please. Do any one of our panelists want to chime in? Yeah, Mrs. Piper, to some extent, that is happening organically, uh, but we must be careful that we are consistent. And I think this is very important. Uh, someone mentioned issues, and I, I'm mindful of the forum that we're in right now, so I need to, to be measured in, in what I say, but uh, our policy and our practices, we need to work on that and ensure that we are consistent with our, that, that they are consistent with our ideals. And I think that is a starting point that we should all seek to find a way to ensure uh, in an inclusive way. Because one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to be harbors of all the right ideas and the right view and other people's views may be diametrically opposed, but they are, they are quite, you know, um, they think they're equally right. And so somehow we can come together. I think it is important that we, we, we pick very clear targets and Florian is here with the solid waste authority and I think that's a, a good starting point. We really need to implement a, a, a sanitation policy that could be an example for every place else. And we need to go deep and I'll be very specific for instance. We have events we're coming up with, yeah? Uh, festivals and the first thing is sanitation. That should be in terms of our planning you know, the first thing we do, that the nature island should always be clean. So we should make sure as an important part of the product, as is bringing in the, 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 the top headline stars and so on, that we have proper sanitation facilities as the infrastructure. And in, in between the program, I don't hear the announcers saying, oh, be sure to pitch it in in the trash bin, you know? And at the, we throw it around and at the end of the festival, somebody comes, whether it's a village feast or whatever, and they collect because somehow our practices are not in alignment with our stated ideals on sanitation and so So I think we, we are in a position to be thought leaders, but first we must be act leaders first and be that. And I think organically some of this is already coming out in terms of Dominican tourism, ecotourism, but we don't want to put ourselves out there and have someone come 
and find the inconsistencies in what it is that we do. So I would encourage at the same time, while we aim to be thought leaders, that we practice the fundamentals of act leaders uh, so that we can, we can be consistent. I hope I'm clear. I'm mindful again of the forum I'm in, so you know, we don't want to, uh, we, 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 you know, we, we want to keep it on a certain level. Yes, and I'm, uh, I'm very much inclined to agree. Um, and I'll allow Mr. Piper to make his contribution first. Yeah, I, I, while Sam looks at it from a macro perspective, I look at it from a micro, and I say, well, um, are there people, are there individuals who are experts in their field that, that can put Dominica on the map? So you look at someone like Dr. Lennox Honeychurch, and you say, why should he not be on panels and platforms elsewhere representing Dominica? and so, and providing leadership in his field. So I look at it um, from a marketing perspective, I look for where I can get the positive out of it. So can we do that? Do we have people who are thought leaders in coral restoration and those sorts of things that can be on panels and platforms and, and speaking to what Dominique is doing, even you know, at a micro level? Um, do we have recycling programs that are happening that we can speak about? So it's, it, 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 is, it is to pick out those little areas and those little things that we're doing um, that are positive and to speak about that. And in this day and age of social media, um, you can positively exploit that and, and, and that's how I would kind of go in that direction. Not discounting that um, as a nation, we, we need to have the appropriate policy and all, and all the right actions. But I think there are some good things that we're doing and there are some people who are well qualified and who are, you know, um, experts in their field where uh, they can they can put Dominica um, on the map. And I agree with uh, both contributions by Mr. Piper and Mr. Raphael. I often say that there are, in fact, a number of things that we offer in Dominica, a number of things that we are doing right that we don't often promote as much as we should, and so they don't get the recognition that they deserve. Um, but in the same vein, we do also need to, to, take, um, to take action beyond the thoughts. So for example, uh, the other day I went to a beach cleanup and I said, you know, if I have to do one more beach cleanup, then <laughs> I, I may go, go crazy because at the end of the day, we have to, you know, sometimes go towards the root of the issue. How do we stop it before it gets to, you know, that sort of reactive approach? So thank you very much for your contributions. We have a question from Lady Ophelia. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for the special honor. Um, I am representing two of my hats with my question. Um, I am the immediate past president of the Dominica Council on Aging. I would like to know what the panel thinks or what the, the present audience thinks, the, the, the tangible one that we have inside here, with regard to including older persons more in the activities that we are involved in. I know we're surprising people that by having senior cameo jams and senior painting sessions and things like that, but what, what, what are people thinking? Should we just sit, be older and over? Or should we be older and not over? That's one of the hats. The other hat has to be with what Mr. Marie was speaking about, the orange economy. I deliberately wore orange this evening to give a big up to my husband and my partner. You can applaud me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I like that I thrive and live on that. Um, but I would like to know how Mr. Marie, and I'm asking you directly, would like to see the orange economy move in Dominica. I hear a lot of things at home, but I want to know how, what are you saying to the people here who are listening? Thank you. I want to keep the passion of the last question alive, so I think we're going to ask the last question first. So, Mr. Murray. Okay. The, the last 
The last question. How the orange economy can grow and prosper in Dominica? Well, according to the definition of what the orange economy is, or the activities in an orange economy, it says that the, uh, the activities that are underpinned by intellectual property. And with that in mind, I think there are a number of things that, again, we have to go back to the government, can do and ought to do to facilitate the growth of the e orange economy. That is one, I said, copyright and trademark and geographical indications are the three intellectual properties that are most important for the development of the orange economy. So therefore, with respect to trademarks, we ought to join the Madrid system for the registration of marks, which will facilitate the registration of our marks abroad. In June, I was made um, aware that a company here who had developed a product, had its brand, everything, and had a good market, his biggest market in Martinique. But he didn't take any steps to protect his brand. And his distributor simply decided, well, it's a simple product. I can make one that looks like it and use the same brand, and the customers won't know. And the Dominican seller of that product has lost his biggest market because he didn't do anything about um, trademark protection, one. And secondly, for him to have done the registrations without using the Madrid system would have cost him a lot of money. So that's what we should join the Madrid system. It will help the, particularly the craft sector. We should look again at joining the Lisbon Agreement for the international protection of geographical indications, which is a kind, um, that's how to explain that to you then. Champagne is a wine, a bubbling wine, that's made in an area of France called Champ Champagne. And no person anywhere else in the world who makes that bubbling wine, even in California, can call his wine champagne. Recently, a couple months ago, there's an American company who makes beer. And they exported a couple containers of their beer to Belgium with the sobriquet, the champagne of beers. Well, the people who made champagne were not amused, and they had this, the containers detained and seized at the customs and destroyed, not allowed on the market because they were, so to speak, stealing the fame of champagne to call their beer champagne of beers. So the question of joining these international agreements, which cost nothing to join, is important to lay the foundation and the groundwork on which these industries will thrive. Similarly, with respect to copyright, we have signed two conventions, the Rome Convention and the Berne Convention, however, with, with copyright. However, there is the WPS, WPPT, that of phonograms, the double, um, Copyright Treaty, WIPO Copyright Treaty, WCT, which deals with internet and online things. And there's the Beijing Treaty, which gives rights to performers in audiovisual productions. We should join all of those. They cost nothing to, 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 to join, but they give you legal um, possibilities. For example, you might have heard or read on the Dominican News Online a story that Ophelia is back on Spotify. Well, the reason she was back on Spotify is because she was off Spotify. Because an American person had claimed wrongly and illegally and stupidly that she had registered a trademark in the United States trademark office Ophelia in class 41, which 
deals with um, entertainment, training, etc. And therefore, she had the worldwide right to use the name Ophelia. Nobody else should use it for offering musical services. Because I knew what the whole system is and how it works, I was able to persuade our government to write to the United States trade representative, the people responsible for United States international trade, and point out to them that their citizen is infringing on our citizens' rights and damaging her business. They did so, and Ophelia was back on Spotify. But that happens to be because I personally know or knew what to do. Yes, so we need to take the intellectual property matters much more seriously to protect everybody who is engaged in business, particularly those who are engaged in innovations. They might want patents, yes, but if you don't know what a patent is and how you go about getting a patent, you might indeed have a patentable product that doesn't get patented. And I knew one of a patentable product, something called banana rum, R-H-U-M. It was a, an alcohol that was perfected using bananas. It had no taste of banana. Yes, and being a bit mindful of, of the, the time, yes. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Murray. But, um, and it was a patentable product which would have been successful and helped the banana industry because you would have had, you know, the farmers supplying him with the raw green bananas to make the product patented and sold. Thank you, anyway. Yes. So thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Murray. And we know that we had so many questions. I'm sure the audience in with us have questions. There were a number of questions online that we did not get to explore all of them, but that's the nature of these discussions. Um, a lot more questions than we have time, unfortunately. Um, but at this point, I'm just going to invite members of the panel just to give a one-minute um, wrap-up of your, of your... Oh, my apologies. My apologies, yes, you did have a the, second question. The, <coughs> well, the short, well, yes. the short answer to that is by no means should, should seniors be, be over and forgotten. They need to be a part of any and everything that we are doing. And they should be um, um, stakeholders and be a part of what we are doing. So I want to state that without any um, apology. All right? Uh, and... Um, yeah, just to wrap up, um, I certainly want to thank everybody for being here and thank the panelists as well and think that um, we should uh, take it upon ourselves to continue the dialogue to try to uh, get a number of points that have been mentioned here and see how we can pick one or two of the key ideas and see how we can, we can drive that forward. So um, certainly... Um, appreciate the, the, the insight, not only to the green, but the orange economy, and uh, look forward to using those as positive assets towards moving uh, Dominica forward. Thank you. Okay, I recognize that we have one more burning question. If, if we can keep it concise, we can just allow it, and we'd ask that the reply also be as concise as possible. If you could just go, yes. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for this panel. It was very informative. Uh, my name is Rhea Williams. I'm the new EVP at DHTA. I have, I'll, I'll ask one of my questions. Um, and the question is regarding to access to capital for um, the population who are interested in these endeavors to either start, expand, or um, you know, improve their businesses. So what sort of access to capital will there be as a result of this panel? Do we have any member of our panelists who is poised? <laughs> but I think uh, beyond our panelists, I think from your question, what we can take is that we do need more opportunities to capital investments because we have a number of our citizens that are bursting with ideas. I myself am bursting with ideas and not enough money. I can tell you that. <laughs> But I think in, in the end, we, coming from you know, what, even what Mr. Dill mentioned, we need to look at how we can gather these ideas and look for, for opportunities for investment. You know, there are so many opportunities. I always say this, even in the green economy, you know, there's a lot of we, 
environment is right now one of the, the probably if not the most trending topic across the globe and there are several opportunities for investment there we need more for sure but there are several opportunities already available that we already do not access. And I think if we are looking more into green entrepreneurship and so on, we can already look at a lot of grant funding available. We know GEF has a lot of them. We have the Island Innovation who's providing a lot of opportunities throughout the region. So I think we have already have a lot of opportunities that we can access. But if we come together and continue to pull these, these, these ideas and the thoughts that we have, we can turn them into action um, by looking into a lot of these. So unfortunately, a, a, quick, a quick a quick, closing, yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much for doing that. And the lady with respect to the financing, I see the general manager of the National Bank is... <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a, on, a serious, on a serious note, that is probably going to be, uh, be, be... We're going to have to get more and more creative. Uh, with respect to financing, um, it um, yeah, as, as as we go through, but you shouldn't be deterred from that. You should, you know, if you've got a viable entity, at the end of the day, you should just do whatever it takes to get it done. Uh, and I would encourage you to do that. We have, for instance, Jungle Bay was funded this time by CBI, but this isn't my first business, and I, this is probably my tenth business and I've had to use all different means of financing, uh, including CBI isn't a cash in hand. You have to be creative. So you have to be very aggressive, very focused, and very creative, uh, and, and, and stick with it, and you'll be okay, yeah? All right, thank you. I think, well, in closing, um, I think I'll also incorporate Ria's question. We live in a small society, yes, but I think if we come together, perhaps, there could be individuals in this room who may have $500, and if you find 10 people with $500, you get some seed money to invest in an idea. And I think in being creative, like Sam says, we have to go out of the box, but I was also seeing that financial institutions are at the front on this side, and I was thinking that maybe for insurance, there could be an opportunity for new types of insurance that helps to create some some availability of funding, whether it's through some other means. I mean, Brenton, you're the expert on this one. But I'm just thinking, not looking at the traditional get a loan or wait for a grant, but let's pursue other opportunities. And we all have different ideas, but I think, like it says, it depends on you, it depends on me. I encourage everyone who listened tonight to try and start by thinking of the opportunities, put our minds open up our minds, put our thoughts out there, speak to individuals, and let's see how we can take action and leverage the opportunities that's been discovered tonight. Thank you, Lizra. Mr. Dale. So, my closing remarks. And every single person in this room can help. I would say Dominica's tourism is 90% based on the integrity of its natural environment. So we need to be proactive and protect and preserve the national, the natural environment, so that it can be, that our tourism product can be sustainable. Thank you, Mr. Marie. Your closing remarks. Well, just to say that um, it's a good thing that the ECCB has put on this panel here, because I think one of the things mistakes we make in Dominica is that we make a lot of decisions without reference to data, and I know the ECCB on its website has a lot of data about the economy in Dominica. So the ECCB is a very good source of fact, fact information that all business persons can use to make decisions about their business. I want to say, finally say that the contribution which I have listed out there that the orange economy made to the economy in 2011 has certainly grown, at least in one particular way, that we now have live streaming of events, which is another activity that has been added there. So we have more employment already. And just to take note that the orange economy in Dominica has grown without any particular guidance or support from authorities. And, um, and I think it would grow much better and faster if the government would at least take the initiative to make sure that the 
intellectual property foundation on which the orange economy rests is as solid as it can be. Thank you. Thank you very much <laughs> to all of our panelists. We were given a five minute leeway. I understand that we just took our final remarks. However, we were given a five minute leeway, you know, for the online questions, particularly because they were a little bit neglected and they felt that their questions were not addressed. So we're just going to throw just perhaps one or two questions, um, final questions at our panelists. Um, one of the questions which came through uh, the online chat is why, why is it that communities with rich history do not use the asset, their assets to create products and services that link with one of the Waitikabuli Trail segments? So I, I, if you have any thoughts on perhaps in ways in which communities can link their, uh, the value or some kind of value that they can create to the segments of the Waitikabuli National Trail, you can feel free to share that. Again, I think that's an excellent idea, but you know, our island is littered with excellent ideas. We're not short on those. Uh, somebody just needs to stop the talk and do it. That's the bottom line. So online person, that's an excellent idea. Uh, let's talk tomorrow if you're interested in, in doing it. You always like to say the one that comes up with the idea, they are the ones that should do it because don't come up with ideas for me. You know, I have enough. So, guys, I mean, I, I don't mean to be, to, to be, to be uh, crass about it, but if you're going to come up with an idea, then, 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 then implement it. You're not coming up with an idea for someone else. The, the island is full of opportunity and potential. It remains that way, and it will remain that way if we don't step forward. Us, the individuals asking the question, and do it. Make it happen. Agreed. And even when we spoke earlier today, you know, we recognized that our last in-house um, question came with relation to capital investment. And, you know, there are a lot of opportunities, again, that I, I think that we don't tap into. For example, even the National Bank of Dominica has a partial guarantee program that is in conjunction with the Eastern Caribbean partial um, guarantee corporation. So all of these are opportunities for persons with, who lack the, 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 the security, I would say, to access um, a lot of these, these opportunities. The NDFD had a Green Innovation Summit where you could access um, you know, opportunities to, to, to access funding for your businesses. So I think we just need to look around. Some of them are available. And like Mr. Raphael said, if you have the idea, find the opportunity, take action, and bring it to life. So uh, we may have an opportunity for one more question. Okay, so I'm going to merge two questions into one. Um, maybe it's just more ideas, as Mr. Raphael said, but I, I'm still going to um, bring them up. So this uh, question is in relation to establishing a manufacturing plan for small businesses to add value to our many raw products. Do we see an opportunity for this? How can we get this mobilized? And in addition, what about our uh, a water bottling plant for Dominica. We consume large quantities of imported bottled water. Um, how can we uh, incorporate this into a local model? Mr. Marie, you can feel free. Well, um, yes, the, the question of bottling water for sale is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, we should actually be bottling water for sale even in the Caribbean. Because in Goa, look over there, they have a big problem with, with water. And nobody drinks water from the tap. However, they all think that Dominica's water is excellent. Yes, and we can sell water over there. But we have to pursue a particular strategy that builds not on selling a commodity, but on selling a branded product. Yes? Why is it, because if you think of it, um, not so long ago I was in Antigua and Fiji water was on sale in Antigua. I think maybe 90% of the people in Antigua have no idea where Fiji is. But Fiji water finds itself in Antigua because they've read about Fiji water in magazines, seen it in, t in movies, etc. So we need to not only sell water but sell water expensively so that we get maximum benefit from it, which comes back to the whole business of having a trademark and then putting the money behind it to create a brand that has 
resonance in the markets you are attempting to sell your water to. Agreed. Um, and I do know that Lizra had a... Yes. Um, the question was asked about the um, manufacturing plan. Yes. Right now, well, I think it was last year, Dexia launched a, a project for a feasibility study that will look at, at actually implementing this manufacturing joint facility for entrepreneurs in Dominica. So maybe it would be a great opportunity. Well, I'm sorry if I'm putting Dexia on the spot, but um, it could be if a, a statement goes out or something or some way of educating the general public as to why they are on that because it's not just going and opening a, a bottling or a joint manufacturing facility, sorry, but it's about ensuring that it is actually feasible. How do we execute this? And it takes a lot of intention to get this out. So Dexia, just to inform the person who asked, is actually pursuing and maybe give them a call, but Dexia could also maybe share some update on this. Okay. Thank you very much for providing that insight. So I think we've covered that, questions on that, that question on both ends. Unfortunately, we aren't able to take any more questions um, at this time, we've run over time, um, so we are going to thank our panelists for their contributions this evening. Let's give them a round of applause, as well as yourself. I think you are a very engaging audience, and I can tell because we still have more questions, but um, you know, perhaps afterwards when we are closing, we can have some conversation amongst ourselves in relation to the discussion that we've had. So we, we quickly invite um, Mr. Ajani Schillingford just to close off with uh, a brief item of entertainment. Good evening, everyone, again. Johnny for that, um, that item of entertainment. I think it really captured the essence of what we've spoken about this evening. Beautiful Dominica, we need to do more to preserve her, more to showcase her beauty and everything in between. Um, at this point, I'd just like to deliver a brief vote of thanks. Uh, we have had a very interesting discussion here this evening and it would not be possible without a number of um, persons contributing to the discussion. We'd first like to thank um, the ECCB board member and financial secretary, Ms. Denise Edwards. She was present here with us this evening. Uh, we'd also like to thank the members of our panel, Mr. Colin Piper, Mr. Sam Raphael, Ms. Lizra Fabian, Mr. Ken George Dill, and Mr. McCarthy Marie for your stellar contributions. Let's give them a round of applause again. Very thought provoking. We'd also like to thank the members of the banking sector here with us this evening, the National Bank of Dominica, the NDFD. We see members from Sajikor. So we have a wide cross-section of um, society with us this evening. We have attorneys at law. We have attorneys at law that became um, uh, into the agricultural sector as well. Uh, so we have many people here with us this evening. We would like to thank the members of the public and private sector, 
Uh, all the members of our audience, the local and regional media, we recognize the presence of MO News, um, GIS, and all of the other media houses covering um, our discussion this evening. We thank the technical people who put all of this together. Uh, we see we are, I think we can call this the pre opening of independence. We have our lovely independence decor. You know, I came out with my warb and I only do this for very special occasions. So, <laughs> and we also see, a, you know, a number of our panelists in their um, Creole wear as well. We also would like to thank Ms. Shona John for, I think, putting together this wonderful event and for selecting such a dynamic panel. Let's give her a round of applause. She's very hardworking and I know she was she was um, very committed to the event and wanted to be, see it executed at the highest um, quality possible. So with all that said, we'd like to thank you for being with us here this evening, and we'd like to invite you to some light refreshments and conversation um, following the closing. Uh, thank you very much, and have a good evening.